the mid-19th century, great sailing ships crossed the high seas, bringing precious commodities back to Britain. Rivalry between ships was fierce, and the competitions to bring seasonal cargoes home became known as the Great Clipper Races. The Clipper ships were the fastest cargo-carrying sailing ships that ever put to sea. Their story is one of the most romantic chapters in the history of seafaring, taking place when the advent of steamships threatened the very future of sail. Tall masts, sleek wooden hulls, and a magnificent spread of canvas harnessed the power of stormy seas and roaring winds. The finest hour for these Victorian clipper races was in the duel between Thermopylae and the Cutty Sark, two of the greatest sailing thoroughbreds of their generation. Sixty years after the great clipper races, a few remaining square-rigged ships still plied the great trade routes of the world's oceans. In the 1930s, brave and daring filmmakers captured the spirit of life on board the last of these romantic, tall ships. It's thanks to these films that we can visualize the glory days of life under sail over a century and a half ago. This unique film is the end of an era, the end of the era of square rig sailing ships. They're not identical to the classical clipper ships, but they look the same, and perhaps more importantly, they feel the same to the people who sail them. Navigating around the legendary Cape Horn was as perilous in the 1930s as it had been decades before. And the sailors who sailed on these latter-day square riggers can tell us firsthand what it must have been like for the men who took part in the legendary 19th century clipper races. At the age of 18, the writer Eric Newby signed on as an apprentice on the four-masted ship Moshulu. Well, I've never seen anything so tall and cold and magnificent as this set of masts in my life. As soon as I got on board, uh, the first mate, I didn't know he was, he was a mate, he got a mate's hat on, just came up to me and said, up the rigging. And uh, I couldn't believe it, but on the other hand, I could not believe it. Looking down was rather impressive. And as I went further up, and he made me go out to every yard arm, and I was standing on a single wire rope under each yard. And her masts were 10 feet higher than Nelson's column. I did the whole thing right up to the top. I mean, I could see that there was, you only had to make one false sweat step, and you, you're dead. As a fearless apprentice, Eric Newby learnt the ropes and the art of rigging on the Moshaloo. In 1939, two of the surviving square-rigged ships, the Moshaloo and the Passat, were both still transporting grain from Australia to Britain. They were sailing on trade routes that took the ships through some of the wildest seas and oceans. When the wind comes, you hear it roaring in the rigging, and it's absolutely superb. You know then that we're going to do something. And you have to get the sails right, and they have to be strong, heavy weather canvas. You can't use any old sails at all. And the danger then is sails blowing out. And having to take sails in, in that sort of, those conditions, is very dangerous indeed. Sometimes require the whole crew up in the rigging. Even in the 1930s, with just a few square riggers still at sea, competition to be the fastest home was still intense. When the Moshaloo sighted its nearest rival, Passat, far behind them, it was a moment for jubilation. And she was a magnificent sight, carrying royals, and as soon as we saw her, we were catching royals, but we knew that uh, she couldn't beat us. So we sat down in the... In the in the forecastle and bang the table with, with our mugs and shouted, we are the best, nobody can beat her. In mid-Atlantic, the Moshalu raced the Passat and her sails captured the full strength of the northeast trade winds. It so sounded like wind round a haunted house. This is before a, a big gale is going to blow, because everybody can feel a big gale coming up. You were using the power of the wind and nothing else, you know. 
Are you using God's wind and bad weather the lot of? Then here is your best interesting experience which you'd never get on a steamship. We, we made an extremely good uh, passage because uh, we were 91 days and we made the fastest of all the ships of taking part in the last grain race, of which were a considerable number. Eric Newby and his fellow sailors were the last of their generation. The era of the Clipper began in the early 19th century when American ship designers built the Baltimore. Clipping meant to clip the wind to increase speed. The Baltimore Clippers were fast ships designed to outrun the British fleet during the 1812 American Wars. In the late 1830s, the British Empire ended trade restrictions and the American fast clippers began to dominate the world's trade routes. A complacent British shipbuilding industry was forced to take up the challenge. Britain began to build a new breed of fast racing clipper to compete for the lucrative Chinese tea trade. Now you have a situation where people are willing to pay for speed. By the 1860s, it had become customary for a very high premium to be paid on the first tea of the season home. And this gave ship owners an aim, an objective. If our ship can be home first, it will be worth the investment. And this laid the foundations of these extraordinary races that took place in the 1860s between the leading British clippers. Victorian fashionable society was eager to be seen drinking the first of the season's fresh crop of tea. The premium that was paid encouraged ship owners to seek new designs for faster ships. The new designs that came out in the 1840s and continued through into the 1860s were ships that had good lines which allowed speed, allowed a modicum of sea kindliness, but speed was the, the ultimate. And even the, the carriage of cargo was sometimes sacrificed for speed. They were streamlined, they had a long entry, that is the bow, and they had a very sweet run towards the stern. This allowed the ships to move smoothly through the water with as little turbulence as possible. The clippers had more sail area than any other previous ship. The smaller sails were easier to change, but the ability to sail faster in strong prevailing winds made the crew's lives precarious. Knowing the captains of these ships, they were driven ultimately to the limit. Many of the clipper ships were lost without trace. By the middle of the 19th century, the annual China tea race had become a major talking point for the tea-drinking British public. Each winter, tea clippers would sail to China to race back to be the first home with the new season's premier tea. The art of sailing these racing ships was to drive them to the limit. The race began in China, driving the ships across the Indian Ocean, then around the perilous Cape of Good Hope and homeward via the Atlantic Ocean to London, a journey of 15,000 miles. Reputations of clipper ships and their masters were made or lost on their ability to navigate, to harness sail, and to read the wind. The elite of the sailing masters would produce remarkable feats of speed and endurance to win the race home. The master and the mates and all the crew were under a lot of stress they were being sailed hard the whole time. There was no wasting of time, no waiting for a wind to come. They looked for the wind. The captain never slept properly. They were sleeping in the chart room or on a settee. And the watch officers were constantly watching for a shift of wind. And they had a large crew. We had a very small crew. They had a huge crew, and they were used to this sort of thing. They, they sailed on the ship year after year after year. And they were well paid, in Victorian terms, which I wasn't the crew had to operate as a really well-integrated team. They were, in effect, the mechanism of the ship. The wind was the fuel. They were the engines. As I was a walking down Paradise Street. 
No race ever sailed on blue water created as much excitement and as bitter a test of wills between the crews as the great tea race of 1866. Rivalry between competing ship owners made for an extraordinary competition. It would be a ruthless race from start to finish. The Great Tea Race of 1866 began in early May in Fuchao, China, when 16 of the finest tea clipper ships assembled at Pagoda Anchorage to race 15,000 miles home to London. The previous fastest record was 113 days. By 1866, you have the makings of the classic clipper race. You have a significant number of these new latest ships, in particular Taiping, Fiery Cross, Sirica, and Ariel. And also, because the numbers are there, there's the extra competition. Everybody wants to leave at once. And in fact, three of them do leave at once, and this provides an enormously dramatic setting. As the first tea began arriving from the hills, there was fierce competition for the best stevedores to load and the fastest tugs to weigh anchor. The clippers loaded all day and all night. Three hours after the last tea chest was loaded, Ariel was first to cast off and was taken by tug to the open sea. The three rivals followed closely in her wake. The racing route was hazardous, facing perils of typhoons, pirates, and countless uncharted narrow rock-studded channels. And there was always the unpredictability of the seas and the winds. To win the race would demand a combination of the skilled navigation of the captain and the hard effort of a well-disciplined crew, forever setting the sails to get the best out of the winds, the tides, and the seas. Aerial Log, June the 5th, China Sea. We are in all probability the leading ship so far, no sign of the rest of the racing fleet. We are rigging canvas to pick up Southeast trades. Here, the crews of the racing ships would climb the masts and clamber along the yards to rig full sail, ready to capture the favorable winds. With a full spread of canvas, they would then fly across the ocean. This was proving to be the closest contest to date. On passing Mauritius after favorable trade winds, Fiery Cross was in the lead. The rest of the racing fleet were only three days behind. Ahead lay the hazardous seas of the South African Cape of Good Hope. Here, the clipper crews flew into the teeth of a raging storm. Aerial log, June the 25th. The last two days shipping water, top mass broke under strain, fixed under run and pressed on. Then onwards into the Atlantic, usually the fastest leg of the China clipper race, riding the strong southeast trade winds. On the clippers, uh, even if they were not fully laden, you would get an impression of enormous speed. And there must have been a tremendous excitement aboard when you were on a reach. Even after several weeks at sea, the four ships were less than one day apart. By now, Ariel had overhauled Fiery Cross and Taiping was in second place, closing up on her starboard quarter. A large amount of it is having an excellent race, racing machine, but you must have first-class crew uh, who know instantly what to do, who respond on the first word from a mate to bring the ship into full trim. And this is hard, hard work for the crew. The great 1866 tea race ended with a dramatic final duel of two ships racing tack by tack up the English Channel.
aerial log, Thursday 6th of September, 1866. Dungeness 5 a.m. Saw the Taiping, kept away, so as to get to the pilot cutter first. They're in sight of each other, they're racing to their destination. One gets the tug first, but in the end, after a voyage of 90 days, who cares, it's a dead heat. The skill of arriving at Dungeness or wherever for the pilot first very often depended on who was going to hang on to his sails the longest. The guy, the guy who pressed on was going to win. Ariel and Taiping had taken just 90 days. Remarkably, the Serica arrived on the same tide and the Fiery Cross just two days later. This was the closest tea race ever. Fashionable London society got its tea and a headline story to go with it. Across Britain, huge sums of money began to be bet on the annual races, and people read eagerly for news of the winning clippers. There were fortunes to be made, and every British ship owner wanted to win this race. So in 1867, George Thompson of the Aberdeen White Star Line decided to join in and build a new breed of even faster clipper ship. He commissioned a radical design to be called the Thermopylae. George Thompson's development into the Thermopylae represented the spirit of, of the Victorian era. The adventure, the thrusting, um, the forever trying to do things better, faster, more efficiently. She had to be a good cargo carrier, uh, a good volume cargo carrier. Um, she had to be fast. Thermopylae was revolutionary. She incorporated the latest Victorian technology with innovative brace winches to turn the yards and to take in the sails. Every detail was designed with speed in mind. In 1868, Thermopylae was launched in Aberdeen. The new clipper carried a hand-picked racing crew of 34 men. They were always um, taking in and resetting sails. They also had uh, stun sails, which were extra sails on the end of the yard, which were on bamboo poles, just to get another little bit of speed. Thermopylae's versatile sailing rig made her particularly fast in light winds. She was capable of reaching an impressive 15 knots, running full sails with winds dead aft behind her. Thermopylae Lock, 1868. With her three tall masts and this magnificent large spread of canvas, she looked like a summer cloud drifting across the ocean. We are ghosting along at seven to eight knots in the light airs. The highly experienced Captain Kemble was chosen as Thermopylae's master, a tough seaman with a reputation for driving his crew and for the courage necessary to push a racing clipper to its limits. The great thing about Thermopylae was that she could sail in the lightest possible winds. It was the skill of the captains in finding the right winds. It was the skill of the crew in exploiting that and making sure the ship sailed well, even in very difficult conditions. That was the combination of the ship and the men that mattered. On sailing, everybody discovered that she was as good as she had been promised to be. She went out in record time to Australia, 60 days. The, the crew must have been elated. The captain must have been over the moon with his success. And there she picked up a cargo for China and made ready for what was to be her ultimate job in life, bringing tea to London from China. The job for which she had been designed and the job which was to bring her her real money. In 1868, on her maiden voyage, Thermopylae's first passage from London to Australia broke all previous records. Thermopylae was the first in a new generation of racing clippers. She thought she was unbeatable and was known as the cock of the sea. Her success was a challenge Thompson's arch rival, London shipowner Captain John Jock Willis, could not resist. 
he decided to commission a rival ship. Willis's ship would be called the Cutty Sark. Its arrival in the China Tea Races would lead to the greatest seafaring rivalry of all time. It would be owner versus owner, shipyard versus shipyard, crew versus crew, and ship versus ship. In 1869, an event took place which threatened the very future of the sailing clippers. The Suez Canal was opened, linking the Indian Ocean with the Mediterranean. By creating a shortcut to bypass the Cape of Good Hope, the world became a smaller place. But without engine power, the great sailing ships were unable to sail through the canal. It would be used by steamships only. It's expensive, the tolls are quite high, but it does, combined with the new efficient engines in steamers, give steamers a comparative advantage on certain routes, but not every one. There is still plenty of room for the sailing ship in general, and the clipper in particular. Fashionable taste was also to guarantee the clipper's future. Many of the London tea merchants feared that the precious tea carried in the steamers would deteriorate, and the iron hulls would taint the fragrant taste. In the very same year that the Suez Canal was opened, a new clipper was built that would become a legend. London shipowner John Jock Willis had commissioned a new ship to beat the Thermopylae and win the great fortune to be made by being the fastest. It would be called the Cutty Sark. Willis employed a rival shipyard at Dumbarton and a new designer, Hercules Linton. The dimensions of the Cutty Sark are within millimetres of the dimensions of the Thermopylae. They have the same tonnage, they both had effectively the same rig, and in fact, if you had put them in equal conditions racing, you would be entirely then dependent on the crew and the efficiency of the mates, and in particular the master. Willis chose George Moody to be the first captain of the Cutty Sark, a determined and canny Scot. His rival on the Thermopylae, Captain Kemble, had a reputation for being firm but fair. Kemble was, um, I think, a natural leader. He could turn a blind eye to um, the odd case of drunkenness, probably the many cases of drunkenness, um, absenteeism and the like, which were part of the life on those ships. Uh, where Moody got very upset about it and would log people and sack them and whatever. The Cutty Sark was launched on the 22nd of November, 1869, at Dumbarton, Scotland. On her bow, the figurehead was based on a Robert Burns poem. Tam O'Shanter flees on horseback from a beautiful witch who is wearing a Cutty Sark, a short blouse. The witch clutches the tail from his horse. Shanghai, China, June 1872. The Cutty Sark arrives to compete with Thermopylae for the first of the season's new tea. Interest and excitement ran high amongst the Clipper crews. This was the chance for Cutty Sark to make her reputation as the fastest of the elite tea clippers. Cutty Sark log, June 17th, weighed anchor at 7 p.m. Thermopylae was just behind us as we set sail from the mouth of the Shanghai River. An epic 15,000-mile race home to London was just beginning. The two ships soon separated on different tacks, zigzagging across the South China Seas. Then, 28 days out, when Cutty Sark was abreast of Hong Kong, Thermopylae was sighted on her port quarter. The crews caught the first glimpse of each other. The race was on. Thermopylae Log, July 15th. Entered Stoltz's channel, Gasper Straits. Fair weather. Cutty Sark in sight from the topsail yard, beating through the straits with a very light easterly wind. Cutty Sark Log, July 15th. Sighted Thermopylae eight miles to the north, northwest. The wind very faint from the east. Thermopylae gradually dropping astern. After 32 days sailing with strong winds from Shanghai, 
both clippers were brought to a virtual standstill in the windless part of the Indian Ocean known as the doldrums. An experience familiar to all sailors who have sailed this route. In the doldrums, when there is no wind, you're completely helpless. So you have to wait for a wind to come. A competent shipmaster would know where the narrowest band of the doldrums is or was, depending on the time of the year, depending on the season. And they would all aim for that narrow spot. So it's a wonder they didn't see each other. Doldrums are stultifying, frustrating, and very difficult for everybody. It's a quite lonely place. <laughs> Bloody lonely. And thousands of seabirds, mollyhawks, uh, every kind of seabird imaginable. When the birds land on the deck and you think, this is wonderful, we catch a shark. You know, these are the events that happen, that there is a world outside. Small things become big things, and you don't know when you're going to get into port. It goes on for months sometimes. In the doldrums, you've got these heavy showers, and we'd all wash everything, clothes, and we'd block the scuppers up, and we'd get fresh water, like that, and put it in the tank, because we were running short of fresh water. We only had an allowance of fresh water per man per day. Unable to catch a wind, time for the exhausted crews to polish and paint, and a rare opportunity to unwind, relax, and talk to the sea. At the Black Wall docks, we bid adieu to Kate and Polly and silence and Sue. Our anchors weighed and the sails unfurled. We bound our way across the world. Hurrah, we're outward bound. Hurrah, we're outward bound. For those crossing the equator for the first time, a traditional rite of passage with initiation from King Neptune. And for some, certificates of promotion. Seafarers have always been superstitious by nature, and no more so than when becalmed thousands of miles from landfall. You'll be calmed in the doldrums for days on end, and the captain stumps up and down, and you think, what, what are you going to do next? Went over to the ship's side, put his hand in his pocket, and dropped some money in the water. This was a Finnish custom of buying a wind. In July 1872, after days hung up by calms and baffling airs in the doldrums, Thermopylae and Cutty-Sark were still level. Then, 39 days out, the wind started to blow fresh from the east. The sails filled and the rigging came alive. This was the sort of weather that the Cutty-Sark reveled in and she went flying to the front, making an average of over 300 miles a day. You feel the ship wanting to go. It makes a terribly roaring noise, and you know then that the ship's going to go, and everybody's happy. And she would sail hard, and you all, each, each watch hopes that they can do a better speed than the previous watch. After racing for nine weeks, Cutty Sark was 400 miles in front. Then, a terrifying storm suddenly broke. The wind's increasing, you have to start remove, cutting in the canvas. So you have a whole crew out, everybody, and you're going to take in an, uh, an upper topsail, and when you get in the rigging, the sail is billowing out and it's cracking like thunder. And if it's wet, it's like hardboard, and you've got to try and furl this sail, to fold it up on the yard, and secure it so it doesn't blow away. And that's also exhilarating, but at the same time quite frightening. I mean, we're dealing with a big thing, and you've got to control it, rather, because it can do all sorts of things. It can dismast itself, or throw you down on the deck, or there are lots of things it can do to you. Or you can fall off the bowsprit uh, when you're trying to take in a, a flying jib, because there's things like the blocks are like bloody great conkers, and they go zooming over your head, and you're lucky if you don't get your head knocked off. So the, the, the whole thing is a series of sort of barely disguised man traps. Thermopylae was now in the lead, but just one day ahead. Then on a fast run tacking towards the Cape of Good Hope, 
the Kati Sark hit another severe storm. For six days, the wind mauled the clipper. Thermopylae was two days ahead and had missed the force of the storm. Then, with gales raging, disaster struck. Kati Sark log, August 15th. A final savage blow. The wind took off like a knife to slash the sails, fore and main top sails, cut to shreds. At 6.30 a.m., mountainous sea struck and tore the rudder from its bolts and carried it away to the bottom of the ocean. Tried a spar, but could not steer the ship. At this point, Captain Moody made a radical and daring decision. Rather than seek a safe harbour, he set about making repairs at sea. The ship's crew were put to work to fashion a jury rudder, a temporary steering device made from a wooden spar, iron rods and chains. They had a hell of a job hanging it on the pintles, which is where the rudder hangs. They made a wonderful job of that, uh, considering the weather. They had to get to London, because that's where the money was, that's where the profit was, and that's where the prestige was, to beat the Thermopylae. The work went on for five days, as the crippled Cutty Sark precariously pitched and lurched on the rough seas. By now, Thermopylae was 500 miles ahead. The replacement rudder was a feat of ingenuity, making it possible to navigate a heading home of eight knots, 150 miles a day, almost half speed. Captain Moody had taken an immense risk, but it had paid off. A captain who's had a lot of experience in sailing ships and uh, hasn't had a lot of damage is a good captain because he has basically judged the weather better than some of the others. It's all a question of wind and they were able to uh, reduce sail before it was too late. I mean, it was a judgment and uh, calculated risk, actually. Some took a risk more than others. The heavy weather that had crippled the Cutty Sark had been kinder to her rival. Thermopylae had been lucky and ridden out the storm. With favorable winds and her top gallant sails filled, she raced home to win the tea race. On the evening of October the 18th, the Cutty Sark passed Gravesend, incredibly only seven days behind Thermopylae. Although she had lost the race, the Cutty Sark won all the glory for her legendary feat of seamanship and survival. She had made an 8,000 mile passage with makeshift steering gear in just 60 days. The race would be remembered for years to come. The Cutty Sark's owner, Jock Willis, had extra reason to be cheerful. Neither his ship nor its cargo had been insured. In the hearts of the British nation, the heroic Cutty Sark was the true winner. But the role of the great tea clippers was by now under serious threat. As the economic benefits of the Suez Canal became clear, sailing ships had a tough time being profitable. During the 1870s, there is a rebalancing of sail and steam. The new efficient steamers and the Suez Canal tend to monopolize the India run, for example. And of course, that becomes increasingly important in the tea trade. So the ships which have previously had their main role on the China tea trade begin to look for other areas that they can exploit. As one trading route closed to the clippers, another was to open. These greyhounds of the sea would race again, this time with their holds not full of tea from China, but with wool from Australia. On this new route, they would face the world's most treacherous seas, the Roaring Forties, and would round every seafarer's nightmare, Cape Horn. By the late 19th century, the British Empire offered great opportunities for international trade and profit. Coal-powered steamers with solid iron hulls were replacing sailing ships along the world's trading routes. 
many clipper crews and their owners felt that their racing days were over. During the 1880s, the development of the steamship made it the dominant way of carrying goods at sea. But there were still trades, notably the wool trade round the Horn, where a fast sailing ship might still be able to make profits, and that's where the next races happen. The dramatic expansion of the Australian wool trade was to create a new era of sailing competition and speed. Shipping wool from Australia to Britain would be the new contest between old rivals Cutty Sark and Thermopylae. In 1885, Cutty Sark had made the passage out to Sydney in a record 77 days. At her helm was her new master, Captain Woodgate. Woodgate was determined to win that year's wool race home and beat the old adversary, Thermopylae. As he looked across at the golden cock on the mast of Thermopylae, he remarked to the third mate, I'll pull that damn bauble off her. The great wool races from Australia crossed the roaring forties in the hardest ocean of all, passed around Cape Horn and the tip of South America, traversed the Atlantic and reached home for the London January sails, a hazardous journey of 13,000 miles. Around Cape Horn, the stage was set for an elemental battle against perilous seas, icebergs, and terrifying squalls. A nightmare voyage for all seafarers, but for 19th century sailors, this was a highly dangerous rite of passage. In the days of the clipper ships, the crew had to trust implicitly both the master and the officers, because without their skill and knowledge and expertise, then the ship would be not sailed very well at all. And they had to rely on what these people told them, and they had to do it with trust. Captain Woodgate's first love was the sea, but he was a man of many talents. He bred sheepdogs en route to sell in Australia and was recognized as an accomplished Victorian photographer. Woodgate was not really an eccentric, he was just different, because in Victorian times, people who were photog amateur photographers were few and far between, I guess. Looking at Woodgate's photographs, uh, what we learn is that the ship, how she was sailed, how the sails were trimmed, and how smart she looked. So he was, he was a good photographer, and we'd, we learn a lot from what he did. He was known as a seafarer with iron nerves, and he had the ability to spread more canvas than lesser mortals to gain the last quarter knot of speed. He was an ideal man for this ship, absolutely ideal. He knew how to handle her and how far he could press the ship and the crew. Um, therefore, he was the best man that Willis had to get his, get his ship back to London in good time, in safety, and with the cargo intact. On the 16th of October, 1885, the Cutty Sark completed loading her cargo of wool in Sydney Harbour. The 1885 wool race was to be the final head-to-head -head race between Cutty Sark and Thermopylae. Cutty Sark was loaded first and set sail south. Thermopylae was soon hard on her heels, but Woodgate was rigging sails with a vengeance. The race was on between the two formidable greyhounds of the sea. No shipping route was more hazardous than the route between Australia, round Cape Horn, and up the Atlantic. You weren't just facing high seas and dreadful weather, you were facing icebergs, you were facing every possible hazard the sea could throw at you. And in these circumstances, the skills and the endurance of the crews were stretched to an enormous point. Great uh, responsibility rested with the master, and with the quartermaster at the wheel, because one error by him could bring the ship into such a position of the wind that our masts and yards would be brought down. Cutty Sark Log, October 22nd. A sudden gust sent the ship reeling. Despite the helmsman's best efforts, she broached to, spinning round so that she came broadside to the wind in a rising sea. 
The ship gave a sickening roll, shuddered, then rose with the next sea and lifted her bow, shaking off tons of water like a rising whale. Thankfully, the helmsman regained control. Probably the worst nightmare was being overwhelmed in bad weather and not being able to do anything about it. That's why the captain and the officers had such... Uh, they were always watching the weather, because if anything went wrong, then the whole crew, the whole ship was lost. Sailing south of New Zealand, the Cutty Sark had nearly capsized. Many a skipper would have stopped racing and hove to, reducing the sails to a minimum. But for Woodgate, this was a battle to master the angry seas. It was time to push the ship to her limits. Cutty Sark Log, October 29th. Reset the mainsails, turning the helm to face the mountainous seas. She responded well, riding on the crest of the waves, she harnessed the power of the following wind and seas. At seven o'clock the following evening, there was another near disaster when a dreaded cry was heard from the lookout of icebergs on the port bow. A monstrous iceberg was perilously close to tearing a fatal gash in the Cutty Sark. Woodgate quickly ordered a turn to starboard and averted the disaster. With characteristic zeal, he then photographed the giant icebergs. Woodgate was fixated by the grandeur of the wild, icy world. More than once, his beard froze to the bowsprit. Cutty Sark Log, November 2nd. From aloft, that old music again, the roaring sound of strong winds in the rigging, racing through tremendous seas but behind this romance is a bitter test of wills. Every seer race course, every voyage a trial of speed. By the following morning, although she did not know it, the Cutty Sark was ahead of Thermopylae and the remainder of the racing fleet. Throughout the following stormy days, in the vilest of weathers, sails were constantly being repaired and re-rigged. The sailmaker would have access to the best equipment, the best sail cloth, the best rigging wire, the best ropes. And he was a busy man because the sails would blow out and he had to make some more. And the crew were also busy because changing sail is no fun. It's heavy, hard work. It really is. Probably had two sailmakers, an assistant. They would need them on those ships because they were changing sails all the time. And the hardest work people on the ship, apart from the cook, uh, there's no doubt about that. And amazing, uh, people would produce from a, a little grubby piece of brown paper a large sail weighing five tons. The greatest test of seamanship for the racing clippers was the passage around Cape Horn. Here lay ahead terrifying seas and unpredictable winds. We had it force 10 and 11 on the Beaufort scale is really something. It's some big, me big medicine that, you know, really. We had snow going round Cape Horn, very icy, you know, and the whole yard was icy and it was very difficult to get in the sails because they were like boards with wet and snow and that. But they put more men on them, of course. Aboard Cutty Sark and Thermopylae, the crews were being driven so hard they would drop from exhaustion. The Cutty Sark had rounded the horn just 23 days out from Sydney. With her wonderful ability to pick up speed, she now raced homeward sailing at top speed, averaging over 300 miles a day. They were, had to get to Gravesend or London by, you know, by a certain date, um, but they also had to be careful of not blowing sails out, because then you're gonna lose speed, and it takes time to replace them. And damage the rigging is another very important factor in clipper ships, and they had to be very careful. But at the same time, press on and keep going. 
the Cutty Sark had made a record passage from Australia to London in a remarkable 73 days. She had beaten Thermopylae by a week. This was her finest hour. The Cutty Sark had finally found a winning team, an ideal master, crew, trading route, and the ability to clip the winds to suit. The combination proved to be unbeatable, and for the next 10 years, Cutty Sark would continue to carry wool from Australia to Britain in record times. But as the 19th century came to a close, increasingly faster and more efficient steamships began to take over world trade. The era of the great clipper races came to an end. By 1895, Cutty Sark was no longer making money. Willis sold her to Portuguese merchants. The Thermopylae was also sold off. Tragically, she ended up as target practice for the Portuguese Navy. In 1906, with the Queen of Portugal looking on, she was torpedoed and sent to the bottom of the sea. An ignominious end for a legend of the oceans. Cutty Sark and Thermopylae were so closely matched that it depended very much on the skills of the crews to get the best out of them. It was very much a matter of luck. Did you hit a storm? Did you hit heavy seas? That could not be legislated for. So the order really, I think, was luck, crew, ship. In 1954, after decades of misuse and neglect, Cutty Sark made her final voyage home. Cutty Sark, the most famous of the old tea clippers, makes her last voyage. Proudly flying a pennant bearing her name, she moves up the Thames, passing the Meridian Line at Greenwich, on towards the dry dock, where she will remain as a memorial to the days of sail. Built 85 years ago at the cost of £16,000, the Cutty Sark will become a nautical museum after being fully restored. The Preservation Society hope that she will last for at least the next thousand years. The Cutty Sark, becalmed and bewitching, is the last survivor of this golden age of sail. When you were sent on lookout, which is on the forecastle head, and you climbed out on the end of the bowsprit and looked back, the ship was sailing towards you, and you thought, this is wonderful. You know, it was a, a unique experience to be able to stand outside the ship and watch her sailing towards you. And it was quiet, nobody could get at you. Just a slight ripple of water from the bow. And the, and the breeze, and that was all. It was like magic. Absolutely incredible. Paradise. You can explore the design and technology that won the race at our website, channel4.com slash science. Next Monday at 8, the Bentleys and Mercedes, which vied for sports car supremacy in the 20s and 30s. Next tonight, 20 years on, for prisoners sentenced to life imprisonment who are living with murder.